We are excited to be joined by Pastor Mark Jones. Mark, you've recently written a book titled Knowing Sin. Before we talk about that in detail, tell us a bit about yourself and, and also introduce the book to us. I'm a father of four and married to Barb. We live in Vancouver. I've been a pastor at Faith Reformed Presbyterian Church. It's a PCA church in Vancouver for about 15 years now. And I do like to travel. Um, so I go to South Africa quite a bit, Cape Town. And I've been to many other places, Brazil, Chile, China, Australia, you name it. And uh, even to the UK. So I uh, do like to travel and a uh, big football fan. I, I'm reticent to tell you my, my favorite team because given your own uh, location and accent, you probably won't like me very much. Uh, but you'll never walk alone. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, um, that's uh, a bit about me. And uh, otherwise, I, I do coach quite a bit of soccer now because my kids play. So that's my, my hobby to keep me from having a nervous breakdown because of the ministry. That's great. Well, Mark, I'm very sorry. It looks like the Premier League might be beyond you guys this season now. It does. Right? It does. Yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, well, we've got two finals coming up, though. So if we win one of them, I'll be quite happy, especially the That's true. Yeah. That's true. Exactly. And introduce your book to us, the reason why we're speaking today, Mark. So I've been um, doing a lot of work in the Puritans over the years, and uh, especially Christology. I have enjoyed the Puritans because of just how pastorally sensitive they are to various issues. Uh, they seem to have a way with bringing deep theology, but also a very pastorally related um, topics to, to, to the heart. So uh, as a pastor, I also know that sin is something that needs to be discussed better than how we typically do so. And so my uh, goal in this is to basically bring the Puritans home to us afresh, but also based upon my own preaching ministry, my own awareness of my own sin, context, etc. So um, that's a little bit about um, me and, and why I, I wrote the, the book. Yeah. Well, a sensible place to start then would be to discuss the topic of sin. What is sin? Sin is, uh, there's a there's a short definition and then there's a longer definition. So the, 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 the classic definition is it's a lack of conformity or want of conformity of God's will or his word. And then it's also a transgression of God's law. So um, this has been typically understood historically uh, in terms of what we call um, uh, privation. Uh, it's the uh, absence or quality normally present. It's a, it's a lacking. And then there's what we call positive inclination. And I don't mean positive in a morally good sense, but um, a tendency to commit evil. So it's the lack of righteousness and then the tendency towards evil. And that means that in our sinful nature, we have what are called inordinate or um, sinful lustings of our faculties, mind, heart, soul, etc. And then we also have an enmity towards God in general. So it, it does start with a basic definition and then it branches out into more specifics. Yeah. So what is the origin of sin and how does this still impact us today? That's uh, that's a key question. It's something in the book. I try to look at the origin of sin because what you have are um, the, the doctrine of original sin is not what I mean by the origin of sin. So original sin has to do with, you know, what the Augustinian view of Romans five and how it was developed over history. But um, the origin of sin is, is where did sin come from? And we talk about um, sort of this in a twofold manner the origin in terms of the angelic realm and the appearance of the serpent in the garden and uh the reasons why he may have fallen um anselm wrote a book on the fall of the devil and uh theologians have tried to figure out you know what was it that caused satan to fall was it a lack of um trust that uh god would be god and satan as a as a good angel would have to remain in that place or was there pride involved was there um something whereby he had insight into god's purposes for christ um in terms of who he would become and satan didn't like that there's been all sorts of explanations but whatever we 
say Satan arrives on the scene and then uh, and then seduces Eve and Adam who was there. And so Satan is called the external cause um, in terms of Adam's sin. And then the internal cause would be Adam's free will. And that's sort of the basic um, explanation for the origin of sin. Yeah. Why did God allow the option for man to fall? That, that's the question that, uh, you know, I think any all of us will have to accept that we don't entirely know why that would be the case. And yet uh, there are some clues that we get from the scriptures that allow us to answer it in part. So uh, two of the typical responses to that would involve first, um, Adam was given a, f- a free will. He was given the ability to make rational um, decisions. He was given a law and it was not a law that was coercive. It was a law that was meant to bless him and his descendants. And uh, because Adam had a free will, there was a sense in which he had the ability to then transgress the law. Otherwise, um, he would have been in a different type of state, which we would say not possible to sin. And he wasn't put in that state yet. The second reason it may have to do with God allowing sin because he knew that in the totality of his redemptive purposes, it would be a way for God to glorify himself Um, rather uniquely by showing things that otherwise would have been hidden or remained conserved in the depths of what I think Rutherford calls the adorable Godhead. So mercy, for example, is an attribute of God that shines forth as a result of his compassion upon sinful creatures. And so those two are the typical answers one gets um, when asking that question. And then uh, you can imagine theologians do speculate a little bit more after that. When we speak to non-Christians, why do some people have such a hard job identifying as a sinner? I think, it, well, and th- that's that, that to me is where um, I, I thought my book needed to be written in this sense. So um, I think there's levels. So you can find that some people will say, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not perfect. I, I don't think they like to use the word sinner, but they'll acknowledge there's things that about them that aren't great. I live in a in a number of worlds. Uh, so for example, the soccer world where I talk to a lot of parents, um, they'll all say things like, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're deluded or or we get angry or we live by care. Like they'll admit to things that we would call sins. Um, so they are aware they're not perfect, but then when you have to call someone a sinner, it brings to light maybe an objective sort of um, relationship that may have God in view. And I think once you admit you're a sinner, all of a sudden you have to then Um, wonder about what does that mean for you what does that mean for you in relation to a a god who is a holy god or what does it mean for you in terms of when you die and so uh, people will acknowledge uh, their imperfections (laughs) but to call themselves a de facto sinner is where they have to then perhaps acknowledge things that will cause them to change their lives and people don't want to do that do some christians misunderstand about sin I think they misunderstand how, firstly, how extensive it is in terms of our our, our, the individual. So let's not we'll talk about its extensiveness is is worldwide because of Adam's fall. Um, But its extensiveness in terms of our psyche, our our thoughts, our emotions, our even our bodies that are wasting away outwardly as, as a result of sin in the world. I think a lot of people just misunderstand its extensiveness. They also misunderstand its power and how it really does affect us every day and to every degree of our being apart from the grace of god we can't um, escape the ravages of sin each day Um, and even in christ we we struggle with the principle of indwelling sin so i think that's the major issue for me is is its extensiveness and its power and then ultimately they um, fail to deal with the consequences of sin and uh, we see that in scripture, we see that in our lives, that sin has real damaging consequences, whether we want to admit that or not. Why is it so important that we have a biblical understanding of sin and that we ha- we are clear when we talk about it with non-Christians? For me, I think we would need to have a biblical understanding to A, first deal with the reality that God is against sin in, in the most um, powerful way, in the most holy way. Uh, and 
once we accept God's own judgment of sin, we're in a position to also accept God's solution to that problem. So in, unless we see sin from God's perspective, we won't be able to see redemption from God's perspective. How bad is sin is is got to be um, mirrored by how great redemption is. So until you see that, you can't appreciate why Christ came, what he offers, uh, what God has done in his wisdom to overcome the problem of evil and sin, etc. So I think that would be for me, um, you know, the real the real issue at stake. Yeah. How much responsibility should we take for sinful thoughts or dreams that we do not act upon? <laughs> yeah, you've uh, yeah you've got some you've got some good questions. I'm, I'm glad you asked them because they, these are the types of questions I think people struggle with, but don't always want to to raise. So um, there's there's what we call um, our our wills. We are entirely responsible for our wills. Um, there's there's voluntary acts and involuntary acts. And involuntary acts may be something where you're sleeping, you have a dream, you're killing someone uh, and delighting in it, or you're lusting in your dream and you're delighting in it. And uh, we still say that every part of our being we are responsible for, but it would be an involuntary act. Then there's a voluntary act whereby we are meditating upon something willfully, delighting in it. And we're responsible for those things. And that's where we get to aggravations of sin. So these involuntary acts are still a result of our sinful nature. And we are responsible. And that's why, actually, you even read the Puritans and others that um, a Christian has a duty to try to align their lives in the ways of God, depend upon the Spirit, pray not to be led into temptation. And um, that can actually help with those involuntary acts. But as we allow ourselves to be gripped by sin and the world and uh, the, the lusts of the flesh, those involuntary acts will actually start to become more powerful in our lives as we drift away from God. So it's not like our involuntary acts are just um, random. They're, they are often connected to the course or pattern of living that happens in terms of our voluntary um, Christian acts. Yeah, it's really helpful. I'm sure many people listening will have had the experience of having a blasphemous thought come into their mind whilst praying or reading the Bible. Where, where do these come from and how can we best deal with those, Mark? That's, for me, one of the the, the issues of, of prayer is, is to acknowledge that sin is present when we pray. Um, how much we attribute to the devil, we have to be careful. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite something to say the devil made me think something in a prayer uh you know you'd, you'd have to ascribe to him some considerable power that every christian everywhere is being attacked by the devil so we have to be careful i don't yeah. have a um an easy solution to that problem i think we also have to remember the devil is not alone there were there were also fallen angels with the devil um you know a third of the angels uh, as has classically been understood so i do believe there are there are forces out there there's principalities and powers that attack God's people, oppress them, not possess them, but they oppress them. So yes, when we pray, um, it's it's fascinating how many weird things can happen where we feel attacked. And I think the reason we feel most attacked when we pray is because that's one of the great areas of our strength against the powers of darkness, the devil. So that's when he gets most upset. Same with worship services. Why do we start thinking, you know, about Liverpool winning the Champions League when I'm supposed to be singing a hymn. Um, you know, the, the devil wants to distract us from the best things. So I'm not denying the devil's role, but I also think, you know, we do need to also remember we are sinners and we are going to just at times not have the spiritual fortitude to maintain the proper focus at times. And we are responsible for that. So we can't just say, oh, well, the devil made me do it. Yeah. Yeah, we know that the the devil, um, you know, is an omniscient and, and omnipresent, like you were just saying, Mark. So yeah. when we're praying in silent, you know, and you might not be able to actually know a definite answer because I don't think the Bible speaks of it. But have you got an opinion on, in terms of can the can the enemy actually uh, be reading our mind? You know, when we're praying in silent, is the devil capable of knowing what we're actually praying? Can he read our minds? Yeah, that's, you know, I've uh, thought about that. So one of the things that I've thought about, and I, I don't see it discussed a whole lot. Uh, and in fact, I don't discuss it in my book is, you know, is it better to pray in our mind or out loud? So if we pray out loud, like at a corporate worship service, and 
at prayer meetings, are we giving the devil an, an advantage, right? Oh, he can hear now what's going on. So should we all just pray in our minds so he doesn't know what's going on and that way we can trick him? I think there is a sense in which he could be aware of our thoughts. So there is an, a divine omniscience that belongs to God alone. But uh, I think there could be a sense in which Satan could have an ability um, based upon the fact that he's a supernatural being of sorts to uh, have insight into those things. Um, to what degree, how extensive, I'm not prepared to, to, to really um, comment on because I, I, don't, I don't know, right? And I'm happy to say I don't know. So I don't think it's as simple as saying, if we stay silent, he can't possibly know. But I also think that um, we don't need to um, ascribe to him the type of omniscience that God has. Um, but how much he does know and how much at the same time he knows of all God's people praying, it has to be limited because he, he, he isn't God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. The, yeah. the rise in the seeker sensitive movement has been well documented, Mark. These are churches and denominations that are purposely leaving out elements such as sin and hell from their teaching. Why is this so dangerous? I think it's dangerous because if you want to look at where God's great declarations of salvation are in the scriptures, you're going to find an emphasis on sin. So, are we wiser than God? Is the question. If God sends prophets to to speak to israel and even to the ungodly nations about their sins and if christ is even when he's being gentle with the woman at the well still rebukes her for the fact that the man she's now living with is not her husband and so on and so forth if 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 that's the pattern of the ministry peter at pentecost you know you with the help of wicked men um are we going to be wiser than God? And so what the seeker sensitive movement tends to do, I think one of their great errors is that they try to be wiser than God in the sense that they, they think this is what will work when God's word is very clear of what he intends to work. So you will find that a lot of these seeker sensitive churches, um, they're not empty. Uh, people do want to hear nice things you know, and um, at the end of the day, we have to be faithful more than we need to be nice. We always have to be gentle, kind, loving, but faithfulness is is one of the aspects of biblical preaching that doesn't always yield popular results. Yeah, yeah. Some sins seem to get more attention than others. Why is this? And are all sins the same in God's eyes? <laughs> Yeah, there's a there is a hierarchy of sins, I believe, and even within the commandments, there's intensity. So, uh, you know, when you say you shall not commit adultery, um, here's an example: if a minister in a church is married and he has three kids, and he goes and commits adultery with a lady in the church who's not his wife, um, and she has kids, um, what you're doing is you're exacerbating a sin because a you have a position of authority as a minister. B, you are stealing another man's wife, but C, you're also implicating children. And then D, you're scandalizing the flock. Now, if a young man is, is at the beach and he walks by and sees a young lady who's very attractive and has a lustful thought, that's not the same intensity and scope of the effects of sin as the case I just spoke of. So we need to make sure we understand there are aggravations of sins. And then we also have to understand that you know, blasphemy against God directly in terms of the, the first table of the law um, is, is going to be worse than, um, you know, uh, lying. Now, all sins are worthy of damnation. All sins are, are there's no question about that. But um, if you were to uh, tell me that uh, idol worship uh, is is not a big deal. I would say, well, look at the judgments upon idol worship in the Old Testament versus um, sins that were um, described as sins of ignorance and stuff like that. So we have to be careful not to say, oh, sins aren't a big deal. They are a big deal. They all are a big deal. But at the same time, we have to have a hierarchy where we understand there are aggravations. Yeah. What is the unforgivable sin mentioned in scripture? And what do you say to people that are worried that they may have committed that sin? I think people who, who worry they may, they may have committed that sin, um, the very fact that they're worried about it means they don't need to worry about it. 
So I think that's the type of sin that even if it were to be able to be committed today, wouldn't cause the person to have a, a sort of godly fear. So anyone with a godly fear and thinks, I think they're the last person in a sense that needs to worry about it because that type of sin, it seems to me, is the type of sin that's such a conscious opposition to the works of Christ in the spirit that there's no remorse, no regret, no worry. Um, and then there's even a question of whether that sin is even uh, able to be committed today um, at large. Maybe there's specific examples, but I think it's a very contextual sin. The works of Christ are being performed by the work of the spirit and they're attributing to Christ his miracles. He's casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, which um, it's ascribing to the spirit through the ministry of Christ, the very opposite, whereas um, that clearly is not the usual case today. So when people think, oh, I had a bad thought about God, or um, I even said, you know, leave me alone, Holy Spirit. I think that's not what's going on here. So, yeah. 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 As we become aware of sin in our life, is it healthy to go to the Lord in prayer on every occasion? It's, I think it's always helpful to go to the Lord in prayer uh, because we're so reticent by nature to go to the Lord in prayer. So Martin Lloyd-Jones spoke about the, if you have a, a desire and a, an inkling to, to want to pray, always, always, um, you know, go forward with that desire because we have plenty of other desires where we're being pulled from God. But I think you can, you could probably have a type of scrupulousness that would be unhelpful for a Christian where they are incapacitated. And so they're always just, you know, on their knees and and they've, they've lost their ability to live freely and function in an ordinary way. So yeah, it, it, there could be a problem. I just think it's probably not the biggest problem in, in the church right now. People going to the Lord too much in prayer. You know, I imagine my kid up in his room and he's saying, no, dad, I can't come out for dinner right now. I'm just grappling with the Lord over my sin. I mean, that's just not my experience. Uh, and I'm sure most parents, so I'm, I'm not too worried about that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to anyone listening that feels that they may have been too bad or committed too many sins to become a Christian, Mark? Yeah, I would say there's uh, two number of things. First, you would you would probably try to say, well, um, what is your view then of Christ and God's purposes? So if, if you're too bad and commit too many sins, what are you saying about the dignity of, of God's son, who he is? Um, did he come to save like the medium sort of group of the there's there's some really little sinners, some really extra big sinners, but you fit nicely into that middle camp. I mean, that's ridiculous. So um, you've got to, I think, bring it back to who is God and what is God's intention? And then what sacrifice did God provide? Was it a great sacrifice or a small sacrifice? And when you see how great the sacrifice Christ's life and death is, you start to go, wait a minute, such a sacrifice meant he needed to come because sins were really bad. Because why would God give up his only son to death on a cross unless he was in attending to save real sinners? Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. How do Christians differ from non-Christians in committing sins, Mark? Uh, Christians are, uh, and non-Christians sin differently in certain senses. So non-Christians sort of will typically rush into sin more. Uh, no, Christians will have some trepidation and regret at times. I mean, not always, but typically the spirit um, causes us conviction, even in the midst of the sin. Um, on the other hand, we, we're more guilty in a certain sense because we have greater powers and knowledge to not sin so that when we willfully sin, um, it's in some sense worse than a non-believer, although ours is covered by the blood of Christ. Um, I still think we have to acknowledge that when you have knowledge that something's wrong and power to not do it, um, yeah, you should, you should, um, you should definitely um, accept that as a Christian, you, you, you share some blame. Um, but at the same time, non-Christians don't feel remorse in the godly sense. And so their sin is different that way. Yeah. Antinomianism has created this understanding where some people go around with this false view that because the Bible teaches that we cannot lose our salvation, then it's okay to go and live a life chasing any sinful mm -hmm. desire you wish. Why mm -hmm. is this wrong? Well, I think there's a, a number of reasons why it's wrong. I'll maybe give one or two. Uh, I think the first thing is um, the whole purpose of the gospel is is to not just 
have our sins dealt with, but to bring us back to God. You know, uh, since we've been justified by faith, we now have peace with God. And that peace with God is what Adam had in the garden. Some theologians refer to it as friendship with God. And this friendship with God is communion with God. So what you're saying is, yes, you've been reconciled to God, but you don't really want to have anything to do with the God to whom you've been reconciled. It doesn't make any sense. So that is why Paul will say the love of Christ constrains us yeah. um, because we conclude one died for all uh, and therefore all died to our sin so that we might live for righteousness. So I think it misunderstands the nature of Christ's purposes, God's purposes and the spirit's work in us to say that, well, um, we've been forgiven. Now we can do what we wish when that was not the intention of, of why Christ came and why God has saved us. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Christians being entertained by movies, music or computer games that contain or celebrate sin in one way or another? My thoughts are that it's a complicated subject for one, uh, because, you know, what constitutes celebrating sin is is got to be distinguished from what is um, accepting of a sinful world so i think things can be done delicately whether it's poetry a movie a song where it's accepting the reality of sin and it's not celebrating it but it definitely brings it to light and then there's a fine line of course between that and then the sort of celebration of it and the promotion of it and i think anything that um clearly and unequivocally promotes sin we we should reject um now we have to be very careful because on the one hand, I don't want to go into the legalistic um, error. And at the other hand, I don't want to be in the antinomian error, which ends up being the same error uh, at the end of the day, because they're fleshly ways of dealing with things. But um, do, do I think Christians have got a problem with allowing too much into their household, so to speak, with TVs or, or, or movies or social media? Yes, I do. I think we all need to probably examine ourselves a little more carefully on how blurry that line is between um, what sin is and promoting it. So, uh, but do I want to get into writing up a list of songs that are acceptable for people to listen to or movies or shows? No, because that, that is a very dangerous way to approach um, ethics. I think you need to get the mind of Christ in your heart. You need to ask God for wisdom. You need to live before God and, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And, and hopefully you can make wise decisions about what is acceptable and what isn't. What advice would you have for a Christian that has fallen back into a sinful lifestyle? Well, the, the, there's the easy one, and it would be repent. <laughs> but how do you do that, right? So it's it's people who fall into those lifestyles. You don't just say to them, hey, repent. And they go, oh, yeah, okay, sorry. You know, what was I thinking? Um, I think, you know, it's complex. I deal with this as a pastor. You see people falling into patterns, and you, you, you go, how do I address this? Um, and I think a lot of it is you've got to have a relationship whereby you can speak to them. So, you know, I do have advice, but I also say, are you cultivating the type of relationships with people that if they were to fall into that, you would have the capital to go and speak to them uh, rather than just um, say something that's a, a pith, pithy remark and they, they don't receive it. So for me as a pastor, everything is about if my child or my friend or someone in my church went into a pattern, have I got the type of relationship where I can say, hey, brother, you know, I've noticed this, what's going on here, and, and they will listen, because if you don't have that, it's going to be very hard to speak to anybody. Yeah, it's really helpful. All this talk of sin brings the reality of the bad news for mankind, but God does not leave us there, does he, Mark? Tell us about God's redemptive plan and why that is such good news for those in Christ the the glory of the gospel is that you know what we what we would have had in adam if he hadn't sinned isn't actually as good as what we're going to get in christ with sin so we're going to see the face of god in christ for all eternity he's the visible image of the invisible god he's the radiance of god's glory the exact representation of his being um, and when we see him we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and that's called the beatific vision we will have an ocular vision of the glory of the lord in christ jesus so when you look at that as the highest blessing everything else is getting us to the point where we are going to be in a position to 
see Christ that way. And so in this life, we live by faith, beholding the glory of the Lord in the face of Jesus Christ. That faith will turn to sight. So the glory of redemption is not just that our sins are forgiven, but that, as I was saying earlier, we are brought to God in the most intimate way through the spirit, whereby we behold his son in this life by faith, in the life to come by sight. And everything revolves, I think, around that glorious principle of what it means to behold the glory of the Lord. Yeah, brilliant. Much of your work from this book is taken from your study of the Puritans. Who were the Puritans, Mark? And when did you first come into contact with them? I did my PhD thesis on Thomas Goodwin and uh, his work, The Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth. And that was such a revolutionary work for my understanding of who Christ is. And then I started to read um, John Owen. From in, during my master's, actually, I did a dissertation on John Owen and read through a lot of his works and uh, then I started to just branch out and branch out and come across these other Puritans and um, wrote a lot of these essays and I uh, put these essays together and sent them to Joel Beakey once. And he says, hey, I really like this. I've got some essays. And we started building up this book that started at like seven chapters from me, seven from him, 14 chapters up to 66 chapters, I think, by the end of Puritan thought. And uh, once you get on a roll with the Puritans, you start to just read them and, and uh, digest them. So it just sort of happened organically, starting out with one or two thinkers, and then you branch out and uh, you find there's some very powerful theologians like Stephen Charnock, Thomas Watson, um, you know, Baxter has some brilliant stuff all over the place. These guys who are very brilliant men. Yeah. What are some of your favorite works from these Puritan writers? And which ones would you recommend of a must read options for our listeners yeah yeah i think thomas watson is very readable so i would start with thomas watson if you're kind of um entry level he's just you just look him up and and find something that may appeal to you you know google thomas watson and and um then i you know if you're really feeling confident i would try stephen charnock on his uh, existence and attributes of god especially the attributes of god uh, there's a new version coming uh, edition I've, I've edited for Crossway coming out in October, and it's really, I think, going to be a, a game changer for how accessible Charnock is going to be. So I would say if you're really feeling confident, go with Charnock, Watson, um, Owen, of course, you can read The Mortification of, of Sin and other books. If there's anything Owen writes is brilliant, but you've got to have the patience and the um, time to dig in. Thomas Goodwin, I really uh, have loved, obviously, because of just how devotional he is. And um, then you can really um, find like guys like Bunyan are, are kind of different. He's not a theologian, but he has such powerful images and ideas and stuff. So you could try Grace Abounding if you want a real good kick in the backside um, or Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah, excellent. Mark, time's absolutely flown by. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, before thank you, you so go, much. thank you, Mark. Do you have any closing thoughts before you go? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, don't be afraid in your pre if you're a preacher listening to this, don't be afraid to get to the specifics of sin. People need to know what pride, what what unbelief, what greed what all of those specific sins don't just tell people hey we're sinners what what how are we sinners um you know why are we sinners is in, important but like what are the specifics of our sins so that we can deal with those sins and lead a more fruitful life before god as we put them to death and and so don't be afraid of of the doctrine of sin welcome it because if by god's grace we welcome it truly we can also welcome the glories of christ uh, in a much more profound and uh, soul stirring way yeah and before you go mark what is the best way for people to keep in touch with what you're doing um i think we have our church website faithfan.com but also yeah amazon has a number of the books that i uh, write and I, I have an author page there but i try to limit my uh you know social media uh presence just because um I'm busy. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, you just have to do a little bit of searching, but um, that's what Google's for. Okay, lovely. Well, we'll make sure that we've got links to the church and on your Amazon page as well in the description below, wherever you're watching this. Mark, thanks again for your time. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really had a good time. <laughs>